Officially a German expert now. Uh, welcome to continuous delivery at uh, GitHub. My name is uh, uh, Robert Sandheim, uh, Rob Sandheim. Uh, you can find me on the internet at uh, R Sandheim on Twitter and, uh, and GitHub. Um, I've been at GitHub for about, uh, well, a little over two years now on the Ruby Rails backend team working on uh, features for github.com. Um, uh, before that, I've worked in uh, different consulting jobs. I've worked at larger, uh, like IT, um, more, I guess, more traditional um, software development roles. Kind of when I first got out of college, worked at um, uh, a large retail company that did software in the much more, uh, I guess, waterfall-esque way in terms of development. Um, and when I was first working at that big retail job, I was you know, getting frustrated with how software was getting built there. Um, it felt incredibly slow and painful, and it was, you know, each release that we were um, trying to get out to customers took forever with a lot of uh, pain, and it just wasn't very much fun for us. It wasn't fun for our customers who I had to wait, you know, for so long to get things going. Um, and I discovered uh, this book, XP Explained, um, out of curiosity, how many folks have read have read this book? Did you today, or some of the, um, you know, more, I guess, agile focused talks yesterday, kind of got you uh, interested in, in some of these practices? So when I read this book, when I was working at those, those early um, uh, software development roles, you know, back in early 2000s, it kind of opened my eyes to like a different way that you could develop software. Um, this, you know, frequent iteration, pushing out code on a, a more frequent basis. Um, and I discovered the Pragmatic Programmer, which is also, you know, highly recommended and kind of talked more about uh, specific practices without caring about the overall methodology. You know, this book didn't talk about Agile that much or XP. It just kind of said like, hey, these are good ways to develop software. Um, and then this one, I would also highly recommend. It kind of changed the way that I view um, software and the way that you uh, interact with your team and interact with uh, customers. Um, so uh, I was changing jobs. Um, got to a, a better um, internet startup in the mid-2000s, or uh, like around 2005, 2006. And I feel like I've been on this road to that's kind of culminated at uh, a GitHub, at least for me right now, um, in terms of kind of reaching the, uh, this point where, you know, doing continuous delivery, um, shipping software on a, a daily basis, you know, many times a day. Um, in kind of an a amazing environment. Um, so what is continuous delivery? Like why, why are you guys here? Why am I going to talk to you about this? Um, one good definition I've heard is it's uh, software that's, that's ready to be deployed at, at any time. Um, so one, what this means for, for us at GitHub and what I've seen this mean at a lot of other companies is basically your uh, master branch is always deployable. Like the build is always green for master. If it's not, then like everybody's freaking out because it's a big deal. Um, and uh, you, you could at any point push that out to production. It doesn't necessarily mean that you are uh, always doing deployment. Um, there may be good reasons to sort of stop the line, quote unquote, and say like, hey, we're not going to be deploying each change that goes out to master today. Um, so continuous delivery is not necessarily uh, continuous deployment. I think right now at GitHub, by default, um, each change that gets pushed to the master branch will roll out to production, um, but there are definitely times when we decide to uh, lock production, quote unquote, which is basically just says, you know, freeze production at the current release and, you know, changes to master um, do not roll forward. So continuous deployment is a good practice, but just because you, you can do that, it doesn't necessarily mean you should. Continuous delivery is really more about, you know, always having it be, be ready to go. Um, 
Why is that like a good thing? Um, that's a, a pretty good question. And for, for me, one thing it comes down to is change. Um, you know, change is constant, change is everywhere in business and in software, I'm sure being in Germany. Um, you know, I remember seeing this, this, the wall come down when I was like 12, which kind of dates me a little bit. But I remember watching it on, uh, on CNN and like realizing that the world was changing um, in like a way that I couldn't really understand at that point. Um, a little bit closer to home, I was just in Detroit uh, last weekend, and here's the uh, Fisher Auto Body plant in the 1920s, I think. This is where they made like Cadillac, the best of the best of, uh, of cars, you know, in the U.S. auto industry. And here it is today, of course. It's like Detroit is just filled with these amazingly blasted out old, you know, uh, hallmarks of the Detroit auto industry. And of course, what happened was the Detroit, the U.S. auto industry basically could not respond to change, like was not listening to the market, and these new, uh, you know, more agile, adaptable uh, car makers came up and basically just destroyed, um, you know, the big, the big three automakers. And of course, now I think they're uh, uh, starting to respond a lot more. But you don't want to become the next uh, Fisher auto body and just, you know, not be able to respond to change. Um, more importantly, maybe, <laughs> for, for, for us as uh, developers or as people who are, you know, working on this stuff day to day, shipping software to your customers is fun. Um, like I was saying before, when I first started out working at the more traditional software companies, it was painful and I didn't, I just wasn't having a good time. Um, and I've noticed the closer I get to being able to, uh, deliver code to the end users uh, on a much more frequent basis, like the more fun I'm having because I feel like I'm doing, um, I feel like I'm making a contribution, right? You know, when you, you ship something and see people that are excited about it, or even if you see that people are upset about it and you're hearing like angry emails, at least you're getting that feedback from them as opposed to just feeling like you're working in a vacuum and not, uh, you know, just not doing anything that matters. Um, Shipping is also fun for your business stakeholders, for you know people that are um, requesting these changes because they want to be able to see that the stuff that they're doing, you know, either has an impact, makes more money, makes you know generates more users, or maybe it doesn't, and they can readjust what they're trying to do. Um, and of course, it. Um, so continuous delivery is all about uh, feedback. I mean, the only way you can get to the point where you can push out your, your, your code every day is to, to focus on the feedback loops and to really focus on shortening the feedback loops. Uh, how many, uh, out of curiosity, how many people here are like, would call themselves developers? Okay, so pretty much everybody in the room. How many people have ever seen this or used this at uh, like this kind of life cycle? Because I, I did, this was like my, the life cycle that I first worked in, like the SDLC. I remember learning about this in college and then realizing that like some companies really did this uh, type of work where you have these linear uh, phases of development you have one like requirements analysis where you're literally working on a Word document and passing it back and forth between um, different types of analysts. And then it goes to design where you have the software architecture or software architect who's you know, kind of laying out how the interfaces would look and that sort of thing. And then you finally get to development and each, each one of these phases could be a couple weeks or maybe more of back and forth and uh, figuring out how to build, build what you're trying to build. Um, I mean, this is this was really painful. I think, in reality, like uh, the morning keynote was was talking about today, uh, a lot of the earliest software projects like knew that this this wasn't right. That uh, they did things in a much more uh, agile way than we often think about. Um, but from somehow, like some this kind of uh, process came to be popular at least in the uh, late 1990s, early 2000s. And you ended up with 
feedback loops that were a little bit like this, where like if you can imagine this is just one release cycle taking on the order of you know months maybe, you know you do the you build it out and you don't get to deploy it until many months later, and you you only then start to get back your first trickle of feedback you know very slowly, and then maybe you have to you roll out the second release, you finally find out like are we making money. Are we making happy, happier users, or you know, whatever you're trying to do with that change? Um, what we're trying to get to is something a little bit more like this, where you have much tighter feedback loops. Um, each one of these is uh, much shorter, and you're able to get back uh, that feedback that quicker. Um, so how do we actually get there? Um, how do we do that at GitHub to, to get to that sort of thing? There's a lot of things that go into it. I'm going to go through a whole bunch of different elements of it, you know, obviously not covering all of them. Um, I think the, the tooling, the specific tools that we use is not that important. I think the most important thing is to kind of look at the, um, uh, you know, think about how you could apply some of these practices to where you're working today, you know, whether it's a small team or working as a solo uh, consultant or working in a, a larger company. Uh, so automation is really going to underscore all these points. It's fundamental to getting to the point where you can even like consider doing um, continuous delivery. I wouldn't go so far as to say as to automate everything. Um, that can be dangerous for uh, software devel for developers. I know that I've gotten to the point where um, I think I'm going to need to automate this task and I go spend like a day writing shell scripts or, you know, whatever, trying to automate the heck out of something and maybe I finally get it automated at the end of the day and then I end up using that script once and it didn't, it just didn't buy me anything. Um, so one rule of thumb that I've heard the, I think, pragmatic programmers said it way back when was uh, let yourself do something manually twice and if you find yourself doing it a third time, then it's probably worth uh, going ahead and, and automating it. And of course, the, the first time you automate something, whether it's uh, with a, a script or some open source project or whatever, just do it in the quickest, kind of roughest way possible. Because you'll find, if you really are using it, as you um, use that automation more, then you can refine it and make it better. Um, and if not, then you didn't spend more time on that than you needed to. Um, testing, I don't, I, I've heard, uh, I think this has been a common theme at, at the talks that I've gone to uh, this conference already has just been um, the importance of testing and the different levels of testing. Uh, GitHub has a lot of tests, so I ran uh, um, uh, lines of code count is an open source tool you can write, you can run on your project just on our test directory. And this is actually, like this is excluding some things that are in tests that were like more like helpers and fixtures and, and things. But basically, we have over, or almost 140,000 lines of, of test code in Ruby. So there's a lot of tests that go on there. And of course, this is after six years, uh, I think, that the GitHub code base, it might be going on seven now that that code base has been around. Um, and I know that we've gotten more serious about testing within the past couple years. Um, early on, I know that uh, there was testing going on, but it was a little bit more um, uh, coarse grained or loose, loose maybe would be the right word for it. Um, but as the product has become more stable and as we've found more, more bugs and gotten more help requests for like things that are broken, um, you know, we've increased the test coverage uh, accordingly. Uh, pull requests. How many, how many folks use pull requests or um, either at GitHub or at any of the other tools that allow you to do that. Okay. So that was uh, a little bit more than I, than I expected, actually. Um, we, I think uh, it's amazing how widespread they're getting to be used throughout the industry, like through all different, you know, dif regardless of language or tooling or whatever. Um, I think one thing that we do a little bit differently at GitHub, which I think is really important, is we open pull requests very early. Like it's often the start of a conversation around a change um, versus just 
kind of like writing a bunch of code in a branch, open the pull request at the end, and look for somebody to just give you a, a thumbs up or to give you some code review and then, and then merge it. Um, I, I would go so far as to say if you're only using pull requests for like a final review for that final thumbs up, then I think you're doing it in the wrong way. Uh, it's much more about opening the pull request uh, very early, even if it's a, when it's a work in progress and not at all like ready to be shipped. And you, you, know, you can indicate that in the, in the body and say like, you know, just looking, f starting out with this idea, here's what I'm gonna be driving to, um, let's talk about this. Uh, so real world example here, um, GitHub has live updates where if you're on like an issue thread or a pull request thread, you know, new comments come in down at the bottom, like in real time. So I started that off with a pull request uh, two years ago. I actually went and dug this out as you're creating this presentation, which was interesting, seeing some of the, I didn't really want to see the code I wrote to start this, but I had to go look at it. So it was 60, you can see from the, well, it might be hard to read it, but the diff stat is 61 lines of code um, in that upper right-hand corner um, that started it. And before that, we had like no, I don't think we had any real live updates on the site. You know, we used Ajax all over the place, but it wasn't actually like bringing in um, any new comments. So you'd be on the page and you'd have to manually refresh to see what new stuff was there. So the very first version was um, extremely simple. The JavaScript was not performant at all. Like I knew it wouldn't scale for all of our users at the time. Um, I knew it was gonna be, you know, just not ready for prime time. But I created the pull request like on the first day after working on it for, um, I think it was literally all on May 5th there. You know, worked on it, three commits, and pushed up the branch and got a bunch of great feedback. And this was the first version. So th this was literally the, the change to the front end. That's, that kind of shows you how janky this looked. Like it would not even bring in the new content. It would just say there's new stuff, like click here to refresh. Uh, but it was like, it was a start, right? Like it was a really good start to kind of show the potential there of uh, how this could be useful. Um, and if you know, I don't know if you can see it here. Actually, you cannot. So I merged this on May 7th, so it was a couple days after. So you may be wondering, like, or curious, did I ship this really kind of janky looking thing to production for all users? or you know, how did I do this in such a way that it didn't hurt performance across the site or, or hurt the overall uh, user experience? And the answer is uh, feature flags or feature toggles it might be another way you've heard about it. Um, the basic idea of a feature flag is to wrap uh, some code in a toggle that says, you know, only, only show this feature, only enable this feature for certain groups of users. Um, so the equivalent here was, since I'm logged in and I was a staff member, I would see this and the polar would be running in JavaScript and that stuff would be happening. But any regular user who was not a staff member would not see this um, and the polar wouldn't be running. So basically they would have the same experience. Um, so what does that let us do? Like why do we wanna do that? It allows you to uh, start gathering feedback that much sooner from fellow staff members or beta users, whoever you wanna be in your uh, feature flag group. And it also lets you start to flush out uh, integration issues that much sooner. Because um, normally if you are doing like, a, say I was doing live updates without feature flags, I might have to work on it for two weeks to get to that, to get the branch ready before I could merge it. Like, cause I'd want it to be ready from a performance standpoint and want the UI to look better but it, those two weeks are going by and the master branch keeps going on, the merging is gonna get that much more difficult. And also maybe I ship it after two weeks and somebody's like, this is horrible, Let's, like, we don't want you to work on this, this isn't important, and like, it gets, it gets uh, canned. So by wrapping in a feature flag, I was able to get st other staff members to see it that much sooner and able to give me a thumbs up or say, you know, like, yes, this looks exciting, I wanna help work on it, or say no, you know, this is not valuable. Um, so this is very simplified version of what the feature flag looked like in the controller. Uh, or it's, this, actually is <laughs> this actually is pretty much what the code looked like when it first went live. Um, it just says, is there a user logged in? And is that current user a staff member? Like that was 
uh, is pretty big. Like this was the controller code. Like this is Ruby, but in, in any other language, it would be, you know, any other web framework would be pretty much the same. Grab the current user and see if that user is a staff member. And then in the template, we just are using that, that method if live updates enabled, you know, throw in the HTML. The JavaScript class was where we added the behavior onto it uh, to kick off, the po kick off the polar and then throw in that little yellow box if new live updates came on. So it was pretty, it's pretty simple, but it has a lot of uh, power behind it. Um, and today, this is the feature flag now, right? Since everybody sees it, it's essentially true. So when we shipped, when we shipped live updates to uh, gen pop, general population users, the pull request was literally one line. It was changing the, the feature flag from, uh, from uh, staff members only to everybody. And that's pretty powerful because it means you can iterate on all the rest of the characteristics of this feature while it's live in production, like with lots of small pull requests. And then your ship day is literally just fi flipping the feature flag and standing back and shipping the blog post. Because you've had all this code live uh, for a long time. And actually with, with live updates, we did, I, th I think we did a thing called a dark ship, which basically means that on, um, on general users' pages, we would essentially fake out as if they had live updates. So we would run the polar and have that running without it actually uh, doing anything in the UI, just to see the performance characteristics like across the site. Um, so it's just a matter of, again, figuring out how to shorten that feedback loop um, in a way that you know, has low risk and, lo and low cost to you. Um, oh, go ahead. Remove like actually remove remove the uh, the if the if statement. We yeah we um, when we've had when we've had some features in production for a long time that for for all users we typically do go and clean up and remove the uh, uh, the feature flag for it. No, no. <laughs> uh, it's not automated. It's usually just somebody like grepping through the code base, finding feature flags that have been shipped for a while. Um, actually, with the one difference with live updates, because it has a real, um, uh, could have a very significant performance and scalability impact on the site, this is one that we've left in because it's just really useful to be able to say, like, let's turn off live updates to do, uh, to kind of let the site degrade in terms of like having less load. But, but for, other, for most of the other features, we do go through and, and clean them up just by hand. No, it's funny you mentioned that because a pull request in Django blew up the other day. Yeah. <laughs> It was, it was, uh, it like made Hacker News and I'm sure it made other sites. And we actually uh, went in and hard coded. <laughs> this is a little bit embarrassing. We hard coded to say like if the pull, re if the pull request ID is this, don't do live updates because it was hammering, it was doing some, some nasty things on the back end. And yeah, 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 it was that one. And we, we went and like, we manually disabled it, but now we're, it, it, it did show us like, hey, we need to, figure out how to, how to handle pull requests that, or basically any, um, anything that has live updates, handle the case where there's like 10,000 subscribers to it, that kind of thing. Right now it's using uh, SSE, shared ser uh, server side events, and it's using um, a C, a real slim C backend that somebody wrote to actually serve up the, uh, serve up the updates. But my first version was not any of that. My first version was literally like the most basic Ajax polar code you can imagine. Uh, so we, we, you can't really get, uh, you can't get to that point without having push button deployment. Um, and what I mean by that is that like anybody can do a deployment at any time without ceremony and without, uh, 
without having to follow like a huge script or something like that. So we use uh, Hubot to, to run all this, um, which is open source, but I mean, there's a lot of equivalent ways to do this um, where you basically, you s your team can sit in a chat room and you can, you fire commands off and you know, there's a, uh, a bot in that room, you know, based similar to IRC bots from, uh, from olden days that listens to those commands and then will do stuff for you. Uh, so th this was, I was hacking on this um, yesterday actually, I was just cleaning up some old code and you can see up at the top, I did a slash deploy GitHub kill notifications next. We had th this old crufty code sitting around called notifications next, so I wanted to clean that up after uh, getting off the plane. And you can see, actually, Hubot tried to merge master into that branch. So there's, that's the branch name. That's the application I'm deploying. Um, Hubot said, hey, there was a conflict. Uh, we, we built in some code to just to try doing that merge. If there's a conflict, it just, you know, it bails and tells you. Um, so I saw the conflict. I went and resolved it by hand. It was a, a simple conflict. And I find, and then I did the merge. You can see we're getting the commit notifications into our chat room. Um, it then kicks off the builds and feed, tells that back into the room, you know, that things are successful. Um, and obviously you can see, you can, you can click through to the link, uh, to the builds to actually see things when it fails. Um, and then it told me that it's deploying to production right there. Um, so again, like you're getting constant feedback on things that are happening in this chat room. Um, so not only is this powerful because deploys are super easy and like you can do this in your, your first week at GitHub, it's one thing that is a little bit more subtle is it means other team members or new people who are just learning about this, they can just idle in the chat room and watch other people deploying and they can just start clicking around to learn about like how things are working. <laughs> um, you know, they can click on the, the change set to see what people are deploying they can look at the deployment logs to see, you know, what machines it's going to, how it's, you know, what it's doing. Um, and you can see after the deployment, I get three links to go look at um, what's happening with the deployment. Uh, Haystack would be errors and then graphs and uh, a view on our on MySQL performance, which I'll dig into in a, a second here. Um, so I just, like, typical day at GitHub is just a lot of people deploying, um, TWP deploying. He's asking for feedback on a pull request. You know, usually that stuff just happens through mentions or team mentions, but maybe that one got missed. And of course, people just talking about stuff they're working on, that type of thing. Um, so chat, I mean, we call this chat ops at GitHub. It's extremely powerful. Uh, I think that it's easy to look at this, um, I could see it, it could be easy to look at this and feel overwhelmed, like how could, how could my team get to this, like GitHub as like all these people have been working on it forever, and I think the best way is just to start um, with something simple. You know, you can use HipChat or Slack or Campfire, just fire up one of these tools and try it out, and maybe pipe in like a simple service hook to get commits into your chat room, which is, you know, with, with the tools out there from uh, that, you know, I know with our hooks, it's really simple and whatever sort of um, uh, code repository you're using, you know, it, they all offer this kind of thing to pipe in commits and, and that sort of thing. Um, out of curiosity, how many, how many people are using like a, a team chat to do asynchronous chat like this? Is that pretty, okay, it's like about half. So that's, that's, uh, that's interesting. Um, so our, our uh, deploy tool lets us do stuff like this, you know, deploy a branch called my feature to, to staging. Um, but actually we don't use staging that much anymore. We use a thing called um, branch lab, which basically says uh, it spins up a, a new environment which talks to production databases and production services, but it's only accessible to staff members. Um, so that's really useful. Uh, again, if you don't have, if you're not even sure if you want to go through the, the work of like doing a feature flag for your thing, you're just trying things out, you can ship it to Branch Lab and you get a link back that would be like myfeature.github.com and you can just share that in chat. Other people will see it in chat and they can just click through and try out this feature. 
Uh, and then we also have uh, the ability to just go to different um, FEs, which is, which is pretty nice in terms of just trying out things that could have like significant performance implications. You know, just roll it out to, to a single front end server for start and to go from there. Um, and underneath all that, like it's, it is Hubot, but I believe we're just using Capistrano, which is the, the kind of the standard deployment tool in the Rails world that just uses SSH, you know, underneath. Oh, and one important one that I didn't mention before, if you, like with our setup, and this is important, uh, no matter how you're managing deployments, if you deploy and you immediately see things start to blow up, you can just do slash deploy GitHub to, to roll it back out. So just having the ability to say, um, hey, I'm done trying this branch out in production, to go back to what master is, because we know master should be always available to deploy, should always be good. Um, you know, this is essentially doing a, a revert, like pull everything back. I want the main the mainline code back out there because whatever I tried deploying like was not ready. Something unexpected happened. Um, in in practice, it doesn't happen very often because um, because everybody's working in their own feature branches and they're all almost all the time, I'd say 90, like 98% of the time, everybody will be doing like this kind of deploy first to, to try it out. And then usually after that, you follow it up with a, um, a real branch deploy to say like, um, you know, push out your feature to production um, with just a branch deploy, at least for five minutes, just to kind of make sure that error rates don't go through the roof and that things are good. And then you do the merge. Like the, the actual, I think the only time that I feel comfortable just merging directly to master without trying deployments would be like if I'm changing, if I'm changing documentation only, or if I'm like just changing a test. If it touches production code, like we always do a, um, some sort of branch deploy to check it out. Um, so you've shipped a feature and like, what's next? What, what are we, we checking? Like, Hubot posted that stuff into the chat room to, to kind of go check. Um, now there's all sorts of ways we can immediately start checking on our feedback loops. Um, we have Haystack, which is our error reporter. Um, there's, you know, there's Airbrake and Sentry and Raygun. There's a lot of tools out there that are, are basically doing the same thing. I think Haystack just happened to grow up alongside GitHub as an internal tool. Um, and you can just see, this is like the 30 minute view, but if you clicked over to five minutes, you would basically be able to see really easily if something spikes in a very aggressive way, that, that's kind of the, the, the usual point where you do a slash deploy and push things back out um, if, you're, if you see that kind of error rate blowing up like that. Um, getting, getting that kind of error handling, like on your site is super valuable. It, you know, if you've got live users, you probably have some sort of errors happening right now. It's just a matter of finding out like what is the acceptable error load. That's kind of the baseline because, you know, everybody writes bugs into their code, obviously. Um, and just kind of, you know, getting a feeling for after each deploy, like these are normal exceptions from timeouts or whatever. And if I see something spike, you know, you know, you know how to, to go and roll that back. Um, we have, this custom app performance dashboard, which uh, we actually did use New Relic a long time ago, um, which I believe New Relic handles like everything under the sun now. We were using New Relic a long time ago for the same thing and we eventually just rolled our own up uh, alongside GitHub. So after a deployment, you can go and just see the impacts on performance a bunch of, you know, acro a bunch, across a bunch of different areas here. Uh, which is, which is pretty valuable. Um, I think our next step here is going to be saying like, look at the 10 minute window after a deployment and start doing automated alerts if you see uh, a degradation in performance. Um, Cause although this is useful, it can be, sometimes it can be hard to see uh, things kind of gradually creeping up or you know, which, which deployment actually caused performance to start uh, increasing or 
getting worse. Um, we use a thing called Graphite to do custom graphs. It's a really simple kind of key value graph store. You just you can just start throwing things into Graphite without doing any previous setup once you get it up and running and just start tracking metrics. Uh, so this was, this is an example of when I rolled out um, email verifications, you know, with just literally um, allowing users to, to verify their email with kind of the standard process. This was just a count. This was literally a key that it get, it gets incremented when you request the verification from our, our Rails code, from the controller code. And when they came, when a user comes back in and confirms, that would get incremented. Um, so basically just an easy way to, s to see, like, is my feature being used? And like, is, the, is, is it being used successfully? So are we done yet? Uh, so are we done like collecting our feedback and can we go on to the next thing? And of course the answer is no. Uh, we can go search Twitter um, for, for GitHub things, which I think we, we pretty much always do after a user facing change. Um, we have an internal tool called um, help, which the important part here is just monitoring um, uh, customer support emails to see like if you know if we're seeing more support requests. Um, there's uh, a lot of similar tools out there, like interface.io is one that I've I've seen uh, a lot of companies starting to use where um, you can actually do this kind of thing that we do in help, where you're you know tracking um, incidents from your users, except it like it can track directly from inside the app using like their JavaScript widget. It's it's doing some pretty awesome things. Um, so if you don't have like some way for your users to like get feedback to you, like in, and especially start to like track that and get metrics around it, like that's definitely a great place to start. Uh, so actually, um, is this like Shangri-La at GitHub? It is definitely not. We have uh, a lot of troubles, um, even with like this continuous delivery process that we have. Um, I think one thing that I've realized actually in preparing this talk is that having shortened all these feedback loops and having these things happen um, much quicker only s like has served to kind of show the human where like our human processes inside like ha can easily fail. Uh, so one way that we've seen this is with ownership, like ownership of features or of areas of the site or of services. Um, it's, it's really easy to go look after deployment and say like, uh, okay, that was a good deployment. There's, there's no more errors and things are working on the site uh, right after because we have those immediate feedback loops. Um, the problem that we've been coming into, and I think this is probably uh, common across a lot of software companies, is that six months or a year down the line when there's bugs in a feature um, half the time, like people aren't even sure who developed it or changed it in the first place. So, like finding out who's responsible for uh, for pull requests or for specific diff rendering part of the site or emails or whatever, that actually has been um, quite a challenge uh, lately. And we we have a an ops team that gets paged when things blow up. You know, whether it's uh, uh, a DDoS or haystack starts blowing up or something goes down, they get paged in the middle of the night whenever something goes wrong. And they've been having very understandable frustration when they get paged when haystack blows up and they're like, well, we can kind of try to band-aid it, but we didn't write this code. It was written like a year ago. You know, you can try to track down who fixed it, but at two in the morning, it's pretty frustrating to have to uh, figure out, to try to even, you know, attempt to do those things. So one, one thing that we're um, changing right now is developers should be on call. Like as much as possible, be on call for features that you own, for things that you kind of are willing to step up and say like, I built this, like I'm willing to be on call for it. Um, developers should be feeling the pain. Uh, I think the way that we're changing that immediately is going to be that haste, like our error rate notification when that blows up, it'll mean that like in a developer gets paged instead of uh, uh, an ops engineer getting paged. Um, 
So we're, I think the, the feedback loop there was broken. Like it's a really long feedback loop of feature goes out a year later, some edge cases hit and things blow up. And like those errors were going to the wrong person, right? They were going to the person that it didn't actually wasn't, you know, couldn't, didn't build it, didn't really know how to fix it. And now like we're gonna be feeling the pain like that guy. <laughs> um, so I think that's, uh, that's one huge change we're gonna be making. I think we're also gonna be like figuring out how to say, um, you know, basically how to tie specific metrics around parts of the site and say like, hey, the performance of this area has, has started to de decrease um, and we know that this team is responsible, so they're gonna start getting pages if it, you know, if performance goes through the roof in the middle of the night. Um, yeah, so that's, that's been one of the most interesting things that actually just happened over the past, the past month, basically. And I think we're gonna continue to, to um, iterate and try to improve our process along, along those lines. And I think what, we're, what I'm expecting to see is that it will continue to be more social and human problems than, than the technical things. Um, it can be easy, I know, as developers to like get lost in all the technical stuff, but often like that just ends up showing that the problem is you know, human to begin with. Uh, so covered a bunch of different things. How can you get started today um, in this type of thing? Like whether you're doing consulting or product work or you know, large companies, small teams. Um, I think thinking about, you know, starting to look at feedback loops that you work in every day and just figuring out ways to make them shorter is a great way to do it. Like whether that means um, if there's no tests for your application, start writing tests for the next bug fix or change you introduce. Um, like getting tests around legacy code is painful and if you decide to drop everything and like, you know, we're gonna do 90% test coverage for our app by before we release any new features. Like you're probably not gonna succeed in that if you have no tests today. But if you just kind of start saying as a team, um, don't fix any bugs without a corresponding test case and don't introduce new features without some sort of like even broad test cases, like is a great way to start introducing tests. Um, also with uh, like TDD as the uh, morning keynote was, was talking about, like that's also a great way to, to start introducing tests. Because um, obviously if you're writing the tests first, there's gonna be tests for, for features going forward. Um, maybe you already have tests and you're looking for like the next step, getting continuous integration going, um, you know, with Travis or, you know, Jenkins or something. Um, there's all sorts of CI tools that are out there uh, that are fairly easy to start integrating. Um, it'll probably expose a lot of pain. If you, if you haven't done CI yet, it'll expose pain in your build process of like things you have to automate and all those types of things. But it'll be like really good, useful pain to feel. Um, maybe you have all those things and uh, you know, the problem you're struggling with is deployments. Um, figuring out a way to get to that push button deploy, you know, whether it's in chat or a script that everybody can kick off or whatever, you know, like start from the end goal in mind, like what would it take to allow anybody to do a deployment at any time from master uh, and like write that script and then like see what fails, which is, you know, the first thing is probably gonna be there's no way to grab the code and actually deploy it out to the, to the production environment. And you can start working on like backfilling uh, that type of thing. Um, and if you're on a team, like I mentioned before, try getting just the basic form of chat ops going up where you have just one room, everybody sits in and start, you know, piping interesting things into there. Um, if you're using GitHub, you can, you can start doing uh, commits and issues and merges, you know, today real easily. Um, and you can also, you know, start getting deployment notifications and, and CI. And you may be surprised at how useful that is um, if you get that up and running. Um, so uh, that's about it. I think continuous delivery can help you get to a much more adaptable and uh, flexible flexible place in your, uh, in your software and also in your business. And I think more fun is also a huge thing um, for you and your users. And you know, it's, it's awesome for the business. Uh, so I think we have time for questions. <laughs>
I think new projects, probably one of the, the best places to start is to do like that end-to-end -end build because when you're at day zero, like there's no easier time to get that automation running with like uh, making a reproducible build, um, making sure it runs on CI and making sure you can deploy it real easily. Like if you're starting a new project, you're actually in one of the best spots because you don't have all the the pain and the, the legacy manual work that ha that might exist there. Um, I would, I think one way that, that I've done it at, uh, uh, at a consulting place where I worked was we would have a iteration zero, we called it, and the, the, out the expected output was literally to get um, like a, a splash page or like a login form, like maybe the login form didn't even work, but we just want to be able to render like something mm -hmm. using our target stack and just like make sure that, that we could do it end to end to start. Right, um, so we, one way I've seen it done, and we've done a little bit of this at GitHub, is we've, we've done hand-selected beta users who we knew were like really interested in a feature. Like I know we've done this with the, with the API. We could reach out to specific integrators and say like, we're rolling out this new API. Would you love to, would you like to try it and give us feedback on it? Um, so that would be one way, would be to do like hand, hand-pick power users and just to try, um, reaching out to them and saying like, hey, would you like to try this? And another way I've, I know that, uh, that I think like Facebook and Google especially uses is they just do, I mean, there's different tools to do this I've seen in the open source world, but basically say you elect to put users into a candidate group essentially, and you, you structure it so that like, if your user ID 1000 or whatever, you're always gonna be in this candidate group for this feature so that that user would always see a, a tweaked version of a feature um, or a new path or maybe get a different email. And then you would track whatever thing you're trying to track, like maybe it's retention or activity on the site or what they're spending and see like if the candidate group is succeeding or not along those lines. So like that's a more um, impersonal, like scientific way to do it. Um, yeah, that's a good point. I guess the, the we deploy the we deploy a, a branch out to production, and like say you let it sit for five or ten minutes, and things look good. Um, usually, the next step is you just you just merge that branch, literally like just clicking the the merge button in the UI or by hand, and then our um, our hooks in chat will see that uh, that the the branch got merged, and it'll say, okay, I'm gonna It'll, it'll say I'll deploy production based on that, basically. And then it will also, uh, our deployment software also says that it unlocks production because it said like a branch, your branch got merged, so I'm able to open up production now. Oh, okay, so the, you can't do another deploy while it's in production? Correct, yeah, yeah. When, when I do, like when I did the slash deploy uh, uh, kill notifications next, that locks production like in a serial, like yeah, only one, only one branch deploy at a time. Yeah, which we have bottlenecked on a little bit in the past, uh, like especially during peak work time like in the US. Um, and I think the way we're, we're gonna handle that right now is doing like the branch lab thing where you can have um, your own environment, like your own sandbox basically, <laughs> which, uh, which is working out okay for right now. We've, we've thrown a lot of hardware at it is I think the main thing we've done. We've, um, one of our engineers uh, actually, um, he developed this thing called TestQ, which is uh, open source on GitHub, but it'll basically take your test suite, 
split it out, like split it out into different sections and farm them out, out to different compute nodes or you know, different boxes essentially. And we're using that um, with just a, f a large number of machines right now to run things fast. And yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't see, I think it's a good debate. Like, I think it's good that, that people are having it. I personally am not uh, super invested in how people want to write good code. <laughs> like, I, view, I, I like doing test-driven development sometimes, and other times I, I don't do it because it's not as useful. And I know, like, at, at GitHub, we run all over the spectrum in terms of, uh, you know, when to use TDD versus not. So... I think I think all the styles, all the different ways. As long as you're you're finding a way to write good tests somehow, like I think that's the most important or one of the most important things. Thanks, guys. <laughs>